shadows. Easy to manipulate. If you have a generation of confused, girlish men, <laughs> and a generation of even more confused, mannish women, constantly locked in a battle against their true natures. Mm. It is satanic. And when you cope and try to... So here's the thing. Maybe here's another difficult. Well, obviously you have satanic, so this is... Mm. We've already reached peak religious craziness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Allow me to explain the darkness of the human soul. So you've got dopamine, right? That's the chemical that gets released in your brain whenever you do something pleasurable, like eating sex. And that's just nature, right? So I think I should start by thanking Stitch and Adam for inspiring me to put this video together. You are free to catch up on the drama between them and Academic Agent. In fact, I recommend you do. But what I want to do is focus on something both of those centrists immediately dismissed. When the charge of satanic was leveled, it was dismissed out of hand as a figment of religious zeal. Here I'll provide a working concept of satanic by first de deifying both God and Satan as it is important to understand their relationship to understand the conversation. The next step then requires the establishment of good without appealing to God and the establishment of evil without associating it with Satan. This concept of satanic, however, will be in no way foreign to Christians. The point here is not to change the meaning of the concept. The concept of satanic is something normally associated with Christianity and its deity, Satan. Satan, as I am sure most people know, is the creature from which the evils of the world spring. He preys upon the weaknesses of man to turn him from God. God is the deity of truth and goodness. His works are all around us. Again, most of us are familiar with this concept of God. It is immediately obvious that the Christian God is not just synonymous with, but is the source of truth. The concept of truth is hardly a religious one. There are schools of thought that reject the concept of absolute truth, Unfortunately for those of you who subscribe to such teachings, you are too demoralized to go any further. To reject absolute truth is to reject any framework in which any conception of right and wrong can exist. How can you be sure someone did something wrong if you aren't even sure what happened? For those of you who do believe in truth, however, I will continue on to God's works. It is important to discuss his works because the Christian God is an active God, and my goal is not to redefine these terms. Both God and his undeified complement must be the same in kind. As a result, the non-deity must have works in this world the same as the deity does. Luckily for us, we have made massive strides in our ability to observe these works. Everywhere around us, forces interact to spin the earth and raise the tides. These natural works are all around us, and we are capable of observing them to an electron level. Now I must admit this is not a unique comparison. St. Aquinas observed the same thing centuries ago. As Thomas D. DeAndre summarizes in the Natural Law Theory of Thomas Aquinas, the divine nature is the subject of science, and the very first principles or premises that serve as inferential starting points in the systemic inquiry of theology are those items that God has revealed to us concerning his nature and his plan and purpose in creating the cosmos. It is not difficult to understand that Aquinas believes God reveals his plan or order to us through inquiry into the natural world. It is important to know that understanding God as absolute truth and the natural order found in the world as his workings is not antithetical to Christianity's own conceptions of God. I am still talking about the same thing. Now here one could reject the notion of an order to the universe. They could deny what simple chemistry can clearly demonstrate and I could convince them no further. Certainly I fear there is little anyone could teach someone so thick-skulled. The rest of us are fully aware of the precision and predictability of the natural world. Indeed, the physical sciences are filled with laws, so-called because they are universal, representative of the truth of the law, and unbending, representative of the order of the law. If you have kept up this far, then the process of de-deifying Satan will move quickly. First, it is important to note that Satan is not a representation of something. God is the creator. From him, everything came. Satan himself is defined not by what he is as God is defined. Rather, he is defined in opposition to God as the inversion. To understand Satan without Satan, one needs to understand this relationship. Knowing what we have explored about God then, it is no difficulty to now understand Satan as a force or forces that oppose nature's order. Just to show you that I am still well in parallel with Christian thinking on this, St. Aquinas himself writes about the relationship between sin, which is of Satan, if you weren't sure where that connection is, and the order of nature. 
Just as the ordering of right reason proceeds from man, so the order of nature is from God himself. Wherefore, in sins contrary to nature, whereby the very order of nature is violated, an injury is done to God, the author of nature. I would like to add as an aside that the discussion of natural or nature is not to imply a primitive man. Philosophers of many schools have long had notions of a civilized man in a natural state. As an American, our founders were familiar with a species of this referred to as natural liberty. This is not clubbing people over the head and taking what you want. This concept is broad and would require more time than is necessary for a video that isn't about it. What is important is that this natural state is both accepted by Christian theologians and anybody with two eyes. I'm not pulling a sleight of hand with their definitions, nor do I think man should devolve into a primitive warrior tribe lifestyle. Again, Satan is also an active deity, so he must also bring to earth his works. Satan is a deity of lies and deception. If God is just the deification of truth and its natural order, then similarly those things that are satanic must be deceptions that run against that order. Just as Satan has no power on earth, but through the corruption of man through lies, the satanic has no way of truly changing reality, so instead it endeavors to corrupt mankind's understanding of reality. So in the end it is not so complicated. In both cases, the works of Satan and his counterpart are lies. So let's recap. God is the truth and his works are the natural order. If you don't accept that either exist, well, I wish you luck in your future endeavors. You're fine. However, if you do understand God in this context, understanding his inversion and its works is a rather simple task. Now comes step two. If you don't believe in good or bad, right or wrong, evil, or have any standards at all, then you can stop listening. Nothing I say will establish in your mind the evil of what the satanic do. You're already lost in a malaise of relativism that you likely won't return from. For the rest of you, I will need to establish some baseline for good and bad that is acceptable without appealing to the authority of the deities themselves. First, allow me a diversion to Aristotle for an exploration of what good might mean. Presumably, however, to say that happiness is the chief good seems a platitude, and a clearer account of what it is still desired. This might perhaps be given if we could first ascertain the function of man. For just as for a flute player, a sculptor, or an artist, and in general, for all things that have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function. So would it seem to be for man if he has a function? For Aristotle, the determination of good hinges on the discovery of the function of man. Not only that, but he starts from the presupposition that happiness is the chief good for man. Now this is admittedly a muddy word to use, but the thrust is apparent. The function of man is where the good or well resides. So for good to be expressed, the function of man must be properly exercised. This will result in good, and for Aristotle that meant happiness. This happiness was the product of a function, not necessarily the end achieved. A second aside is I realize what is good varies greatly from the Stoic to the Libertine, and the things that make true happiness vary. But it is suffice to say that this standard for goodness, that it comes from actions that complement the world and lead to a desirable state of affairs for those involved, is a standard that most people can agree with. However, if the conception of good to you involves the widespread disruption of the world around you in service of ends that make people miserable, I would submit that you are the baddie. Are we the baddies? So to continue, might this function be related to the true order of the world? It would seem then that acting in accordance with truth would uncover the function Aristotle seeks. As such, that order is good, at least in as far as it leads us to function well. If you haven't noticed the theme yet, this overlaps with the Christian understanding of good as a product of God. I would be careful though of calling Aristotle a Christian simply because, like the Christians, he noticed there was a right order to the world. As a result, that which subverts the true order of the world also leads man from functioning well. This is the satanic at play. This is evil not just to the God-fearing Christian, but for anybody seeking the purpose of being, or indeed truth itself. As before, this deceit can only mask reality. Eventually, reality will reimpose itself, and when it does, it brings grave consequences with it. If this isn't self-evident, you simply have to attempt to ignore a pull as you walk into it. No amount of deception will save you from the pain. It is certainly stupid to bring this punishment down on yourself. Might it be evil to lead others into similar injury? So what does this all mean? Put simply, acts that contradict the natural order visit harm on those who engage in them, and those who encourage these behaviors lead those people to harm. Those acts and the people who encourage them are satanic. 
nothing requiring a deity or anything beyond what we can observe or reason. It is also important to note that many organized satanic religions do not recognize Satan as deity, but as a concept. The Church of Satan, the one based on LaVey's teachings, not the one that is a political stunt run by adult children still angry at their religious parents, lists nine satanic statements. These statements include, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse. For these Satanists, Satan isn't a supernatural creature, but a representation of the inversion of Christian teachings, among them the golden rule itself. The faithful might cast that as rejecting the truth of God. Both would call it satanic. The point of all this is that a dismissive charge of religious craziness is not only intellectually lazy, but dishonest. It is perfectly possible for something to be satanic without the need for a deity. A simple notion of right and wrong tied to the order of the natural world is all one need accept. It is incredible to me that this dismissive nonsense is thrown at any concept that smacks of religion to the exclusion of many metaphysical theories from a vast number of intellectual schools, many of them not theological. Truth does exist. It is good to strive to fulfill your natural station as a man or woman, and it is evil to lead people astray because they will suffer for it. 